I want to welcome everyone, both panelists uh, and attendees. For those who don't know me, my name is Amy Krupel, and I'm the director uh, of the UF Center for European Studies. Our center is both a Jean Monnet Center of Excellence and a Title VI National Resource Center for Europe, housed in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. We are a multidisciplinary area and language studies center. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Our discussion today will be recorded and available on the UF CES website. We will have a Q&A session following the various presentations, and we ask uh, attendees to please submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please do not use the chat function. Again, thanks everyone for joining us today. We're discussing Ukraine and the crisis of European security. Uh, I, while each of our guests uh, is extremely notable, uh, again, in the interest of time, I'm going to give a very brief introduction. When we post the recorded talk, we'll provide full bios for each of our panelists. But for right now, let me just welcome Stephen uh, Hansen, who is Vice Provost for Academic and International Affairs, and the Letty Pate Evans Professor in the Department of Government at William and Mary. Sergei Kudelia, who is Associate Professor of Political Science at Baylor University. Olga Onuch, who is the Senior Lecturer in Politics at the University of Manchester and Yuleno Subotic, who is the Professor of Political Science at Georgia State University. Moderating today's panel is Michael Bernard, who is the Raymond and Miriam Ehrlich Chair in the Department of Political Science at the University of Florida and a professor in the Department of Political Science. At the end of the event, uh, all attendees will be taken to a brief survey. We do ask that you take the moment to complete it so that we can continue to improve and provide valuable programs into the future. And with that, I will hand the proverbial virtual mic over to Professor Bernard to begin the conversation. All right, I've asked the discussants to speak at will on what, what interests them to go for about 10 minutes. We'll go in alphabetical order. And I should add that Stephen Hansen uh, not only holds uh, the positions that Amy has uh, mentioned, but he's a specialist on the historical evolution of regimes in Europe and one of the country's leading scholars of Russian politics. Steve, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Michael and Amy. Uh, it's really an honor to be here with you. Well, to begin today, uh, I'll say something that's probably obvious to everybody by now, but still worthy of note, which is the stakes really could not be higher with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we are talking, as President Zelensky recently noted this morning to Congress, uh, about the biggest war in Europe since World War II. Uh, little that I think in my life I would hear the U.S. president talk about World War III as a potential outcome of what we're dealing with right now, and that just happened. This is an unprovoked assault on Ukrainian democracy by an autocratic imperial Russia. It's really important to emphasize that because uh, any attempt to spin this in some other direction is not understanding the nature of this assault. The mass casualties and refugee flows just continue to escalate in tragic and heartbreaking ways. We're now well over 3 million Ukrainians who fled uh, and the burden and uh, cost that's going to place on Europe, but also, of course, most importantly on the families that are affected is incalculable. And we just have to start really praying that there's going to be some stop to the shelling of cities, the siege of cities like Mariupol, which is leading to untold suffering. There is, of course, as I mentioned, the possibility that this does turn into an open war between NATO and Russia, with uh, nuclear scenarios being contemplated on both sides. So with these stakes, it's not surprising. A lot of the attention these days uh, turns to the question of understanding why President Vladimir Putin would launch an event of this uh, enormity. And I want to try to give the argument briefly here uh, in the short time we have that it's not really helpful for us to get into the usual dichotomy of either seeing Putin as a rational actor on the one hand or as crazy on the other. Um, that's a very typical pattern actually in US analysis of foreign policy. Uh, we tend to think leaders are pragmatic or rational when they're getting along with us or when they're obeying the rules of the system. When they fail to do so, we frequently switch um, to calling them mad. You saw that with Saddam Hussein, for example, in the run-up to the Iraq war. We had thought of him as a pragmatist. Then, of course, we started talking about him as crazy. And neither category really gets us a sense of the sociological uh, underpinnings of the kind of regime that would launch this sort of event, nor does it really tell us anything about his motivations going forward. So uh, based on the recent article published in Perspectives on Politics just this month uh, that I've co-authored with my good friend and co-author Jeff Kopstein from University University of California, Irvine, 
we think of Putin really as almost the quintessential patrimonial dictator. A patrimonial leader, as you see on the slide, has a specific definition uh, coming from Max Weber, which is ruled by self-aggrandizing men who present themselves as the embodiment of the nation, demand a personal loyalty, uh, absolute loyalty, and they run the state, this is quite important, as a kind of family business so that they can hand out pieces of it to their cronies, to their supporters, um, sometimes very lucrative pieces. This fits Putin to a T, and uh, it does help to explain, we think, why this uh, particular event has unfolded the way it has. In short, Putin's goal is not to rebuild the USSR, despite the frequent statement you hear that he said it was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century that the Soviet Union collapsed. Rather, Putin, even in that statement, is hearkening back to a, a notion very prominent in conservative Russian nationalist circles that the USSR itself is simply the continuation of a thousand year history going back to the Christianization uh, and building ultimately of, of Kiev and Rus, which they of course then link to uh, present day Ukraine and call it not a real nation. This is a mythical notion of the Russian empire being rebuilt, nothing based in historical fact. You have also clearly seen in Putin this, right on his face, this incredible resentment. Uh, uh, one thinks of Leah Greenfeld's important work on nationalism uh, and the kind of nationalism she termed resentiment nationalism, using Nietzsche's understanding of resentment. And this really fits here too. So it's not just a patrimonial regime, but one steeped in resentment against a perceived set of slights uh, visited supposedly by the West. And I want to mention in, these sli in this slide that in, a, in, in an interesting way, Putin's resentment reflected larger kinds of social resentment that you found among many Russians in the collapse of the Soviet Union and the aftermath. So first you have Putin's clear resentment that the Soviet Union collapsed as he thought suddenly out of nowhere, he was stationed in East Germany at the time. So he missed out on Gorbachev's perestroika. From his memoirs, it's clear that the order to kind of stand down when the Berlin Wall was falling seemed completely artificial and out of nowhere. And from that point on, it seemed to him nothing more than a conspiracy. While we were celebrating the end of history, Western glee, he and those like him saw this collapse of a superpower as a terrible, uh, artificial event, and many Russians felt the same way. Then in the 1990s, the so-called wild 1990s, if you speak to Russians, we gave lots of advice on how to create a market economy, on how to create market-based institutions. That advice unfortunately coincided with the collapse of the Russian GDP by about half, much of its Soviet industry that had to collapse anyway, but nevertheless painful and dislocating for vast numbers of Russians. So the resentment about the wild 90s uh, in Western advice is also widely shared in Russia, or at least it has been until these current events. Then in the more recent decades, in 2000 and on, after Putin was uh, elected president, you had Putin rebuilding the Russian state, as he put it, uh, emphasizing Russian gasudastvanist, kind of loosely translated as statehood, at a time when the West had mostly written Russia off, saying Russia is finished, Russia was doomed to demographic collapse, Russia was no longer a serious geopolitical force in the world. And of course, at the same time, we were promoting democracy, quite understandably, but from the Putin point of view, we were ignoring their rebuilding of statehood, aided by high oil and uh, gas prices, by the way, and instead emphasizing uh, civil society from below in a way that could be seen as threatening to that statehood, or at least Putin portrayed it like that. My emphasis here is that at this point, this kind of resentment is shared by a lot of people, and it explains why Russians tended to be uh, quite supportive of Putin in this period, why his popularity was so high. But it is fair to say over the last decade plus, the regime has hardened considerably. A way to understand this is that Putin's regime has moved from what you might term a plebiscitarian kind of patrimonialism, plebiscitarianism referring to the occasional ability of people to vote, sort of up or down, da or niet, on Putin's regime, and to do so with legal elements like semi-fidelity to a constitution, you know, elections with some opposition parties, a little bit of a free press, that plebiscitarian element meant that there were elements of the Putin regime that were not simply traditional patrimonialism, but included more liberal minded European oriented uh, people who could imagine that they supported Putin's regime as well because it hadn't hardened so much. But already from 2008, and this is important to emphasize, the foreign policy consequences of the patrimonial regime in Russia had become clear with the invasion of Georgia and the so-called recognition of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. By the time Russians who are upset about the 
the kind of uh, curtailing of democratic freedom are protesting in the tens of thousands in Moscow and other major Russian cities in 2011, 2012, Putin now is uh, using that same resentful lens to label all of these protests as nothing more than artificial efforts by none other than Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, to undermine stateness again in Russia. And then Ukraine's earlier Euromaidan revolution of 2013, 2014 uh, solidified in Putin's mind, both the notion that artificial protests were being fomented by the West and had nothing to do with the realities of history in Ukraine, quite wrong, but also the way to uh, approach this in Russian foreign policy was through military invasion. That is the annexation of Crimea and uh, illegal invasion of the Donbass, both illegal. So what this means is after 2014, you have a significant narrowing of Putin's base from the larger group you could include with the resentment against the West I mentioned and the plebiscitarian elements to a purely czarist regime. After all, patrimonialism was used by Weber to refer to czarism, that's where the term kind of got its start for Weber. And increasingly after 2014, Putin has moved to something like a czarist de facto uh, status. So this helps us understand what was really an unbelievably disastrous mistake. And let's leave aside that it's evil and immoral, which I could add, simply to explain why from Putin's perspective, he would make an invasion decision that so clearly had nothing to do uh, with the situation on the ground. Here, from this lens, you can understand first the vast underestimation of Ukrainian national solidarity and democracy. That is to say, the whole lineage that I just described was one in which every effort to build democracy and civil society in the post-communist space was understood by Putin and his leadership as artificial and not real, but also that Ukraine itself was not really a nation, as Putin began to say in the 2000s, uh, because after all, it's all part of the Russian history that had been artificially broken up with the Soviet collapse. You saw the famous quote, Ukraine is being held hostage by a band of drug addicts and neo-Nazis. This was early in the invasion when he was calling on Ukrainians to overthrow President Zelensky as a regime that was somehow foreign to them. At the same time, the vast underestimation of Western and NATO solidarity can be explained in similar terms. Putin seems to have bought into some of his ideologists' assumptions that the cycles of history had decisively turned against the liberal West and in favor of the stateness being built in Russia and China, we might add. His notion was that with a kind of an older president in the United States and polarization, a recent president who was, let's say, not very supportive of NATO, with Merkel having re retired and being replaced by a coalition government in Germany that he didn't think would be particularly difficult to get on his side with the gas uh, dependency there and longstanding relationships with the Social Democratic Party. With the French President Macron, who wanted to have his own direct line to Moscow and frequently talked about NATO in somewhat disparaging terms, calling it brain dead at one point, his notion was this is the moment to strike and will end up uh, breaking apart the entire West, which would be a kind of double victory. Also a vast underestimation of the bite of Western sanctions, and in particular, the moral condemnation of doing business as usual in Russia, something Putin from his background could never understand could be genuine. The idea that you couldn't have Starbucks or McDonald's or even Goldman Sachs operating as usual in the country because of the moral condemnation that would bring to your business never entered his mind. You add all of those kinds of vast underestimations of the facts with the echo chamber of patrimonial rule, which exists anyway in the patrimonial regime, redoubled by a leader terrified of catching COVID and unable to meet with people unless they have two-week quarantines or sit at a very long table's distance. Just a quick word on China because it comes up in Q&A. I, I know my time is running out, so I'll just mention um, both the common interest here that China clearly had with Russia, it's really about countering US quote unquote liberal hegemony. Both China and Russia deeply feel that the world system as the US more or less has led since the end of the Cold War was unfair to their uh, interests and their state uh, identities. Uh, they also would like both of them to seize territories they consider to be historically wrongly disconnected from them, obviously Taiwan in the case of China, and there's a lot of trade and energy and arms between the two countries. But it's important to emphasize this is not an absolute uh, identification of, of interests. She does diverge from Putin quite a lot both in the understanding of Ukraine as a sovereign nation, which uh, the Chinese leadership says is very true, also uh, ties with Ukraine, economic and otherwise have been quite friendly. And so they've ended up with this rhetorical balancing act, having obviously blessed the invasion at the end of the Olympics, but also not wanting it to have gone that far. Uh, they're caught in the middle, but in a way there's nothing pushing them to take one side or the other. So they'll bide their time. So where are we headed? Last slide. 
scenario one didn't look very likely when this all uh, began. I will confess my first two days of this, I did not imagine Ukraine could win. That is on the table now. There is the possibility with the incredibly bad morale among Russian uh, conscripts now too, as well as regular troops, uh, the clear lack of preparation that most of them had for a long bloody occupation of a country many of them considered to be very close to their own uh, with relatives there. It is possible that there will be enough defections and enough counter moves uh, by the Ukrainian side that they will push the invader back. We'll see. But more likely, probably, is a pretty long lasting, bloody occupation regime of the sort that's already being attempted to put in place. Um, if that happens, we know, and it's already occurred since I actually wrote the slide, um, the Russian opposition will either be crushed or they'll leave. Of course, now the more recent events is that many of the more educated and um, anti Putin populations are trying to find ways out to Yerevan, Istanbul, any place you can get. Would we get defections at the top? Would that bring this to an end? It's possible, though it's rare in history in the first year of an invasion that you would have that degree of dissensus among uh, military or security service leaders. It's a small group of men who made this decision with Putin, most of them with very much his worldview, and all of them implicated in this crime. So none of them are going to feel particularly good about the, the odds of first succeeding with a coup and then being treated nicely by the West afterward. So I wouldn't count on it, though if this drags on, of course, uh, there could be that kind of finger pointing and ultimate defection. Popular uprisings in Russia, I think, are also a longer term prospect. When the sanctions fight fully, default is perhaps on the table as we speak. Uh, it's not going to happen right away because right now it's not as clear as it will be later just how terrible and devastating this will be for the Russian economy. But we do know Russians have protested, as I mentioned before, frequently. There have also been protests uh, in far-flung regions of Russia against Moscow's overweening control. It's a really large country with a pretty weak bureaucracy. So certainly it's possible to imagine that, as we saw in World War I, uh, a Russian czarist regime may not survive all that long, a year or two at most, before uh, this kind of dissensus becomes really serious. And finally, could we negotiate some solution? Right now, as we speak, there are really positive signs on both the Ukrainian and Russian side that they're at the table, they're trying to figure out some negotiated solution. The Ukrainians have said they are willing to accept neutrality a la Austria in the Austrian State Treaty as a possible way out of this. I have a little bit of skepticism, I'll see what our colleagues think, I worry that with Putin still in control of the Russian regime and the history that we have to somehow overcome, Putin will continue to demand completely unacceptable territorial concessions uh, in Donbass and Crimea, as in addition to a neutrality pledge that might be acceptable to Zelensky and the Ukrainian government. So let's hope, because of course negotiation would be better than continued bloodshed, bloodshed but it's definitely not a done deal. The conclusion then, the key to Western success for any of these scenarios is a renewed commitment to the global liberal order. That has come through in ways I think very few of us would have predicted, but maintaining it in the face of high gas prices, difficult times in Europe, uh, just the length of time that needs to uh, be uh, traversed before we reach a solution, that will, uh, that will be seen. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, next up is Serhi Kudalia, in addition, uh, to his position. He's a leading national expert on Ukrainian politics, and he has uh, substantive specializations in regime change, institutional design, and the politics of civil war. I turn it over to you, Serhe. Okay, thank you very much. Um, um, so let me share with you uh, some of my preliminary conclusions um, about the war between Russia and Ukraine. First, I will talk about uh, what I think are Russia's goal in this war, um, Ukraine's goal in this war. Um, I will talk about the meaning of the resistance that we've seen from the Ukrainians, both uh, military resistance and nonviolent resistance. I will then address the question about the possibility of the settlement. Uh, and I will talk about finally the implications for the West. So let me first start with Russia's goal in this war. And I fully agree with uh, Dr. Hansen um, that this war is not about security. It's not about NATO enlargement. It's not about mythical Nazis, Nazis that exist in uh, some kind of Ukrainian government. This war in the narrow sense is about regaining the lost territories that Putin thinks belong rightfully to Russia. 
In some broader sense, it is the war that is meant to rectify the mistakes of Putin's predecessors. And we heard in his speech how he criticized Lenin, Stalin, Gorbachev for all the wrong things that they've done. In also broader sense, it is about historical justice that Putin thinks has to triumph because the post-Cold War world in which Putin came as president of Russia was fundamentally unjust from his standpoint. It fundamentally disadvantaged Russia as a major power. And he kept complaining about that for the entire 20 years of his presidency. So now he wants to create a post-post-Cold War world. And in that world, there will be no place for Ukraine. Ukraine has to be erased from the political map of Europe from Putin's standpoint. There may exist some smaller form of Ukraine in different borders, but certainly not in those borders, which will encompass the area that Putin thinks is part of Russia's homeland. Now, what are the Ukrainian goals uh, in this war? Well, the main goal and the main purpose and the main objective that Ukrainians have is to view this war as a historic chance, a historic chance for the Ukrainian nation to prove that its statehood is not an accident. Its statehood is not an aberration, but its statehood is a logical outcome of a very long and arduous nation building project. We've seen over the period of the 20th century, multiple attempts to establish the Ukrainian state. And all of these attempts ended very quickly in the defeat of those who led this struggle for independence. And many Ukrainians now start their day, and this is something that is common, and I hear that a lot in conversations with Ukrainians, that it is the 20th. So today is the 20th day since Russia's assault on Ukraine, but it's the 20th day of an eight-year war that has lasted for centuries. So from this standpoint, the war against Ukraine is not an accidental blip on the radar, but a part of a longer pattern that starts not only with Putin, but with the Russian Tsars who were trying to destroy Ukraine and Ukrainians and Ukrainian culture. And so we indeed fought multiple wars with the Russians, with the Poles, with the Turks throughout our history. But this is the four first war in which we are fighting for the state that existed for 30 years. For me personally, most of my lifetime is Ukrainian state. And for many, several generations already of Ukrainians, Ukraine is the only political entity, the only political unit that they know. And so for them, the attack on Ukraine from Putin's uh, Russia is a direct challenge to what to who they are, to the essence of their identity. And that is an attack on them being citizens of Ukraine, um, singing a Ukrainian anthem and uh, uh, saluting the blue and uh, yellow flag. Now, the strength of the military and civic resistance that we've seen from Ukrainians over the last uh, three weeks demonstrates to us, to Europe, to the world, to Russians as well, the value of Ukrainian that, you, uh, that Ukrainians attach to their statehood and the embrace of the Ukrainian statehood and the idea of Ukraine by the overwhelming majority of Ukrainians. I've studied the uh, conflict in Donbass very closely, and I see clearly the contrast between the way the conflict in Donbass unfolded in 2014 and the way this war is unfolding right now. In 2014, on multiple squares and towns of Donbas, we've seen people who were coming out with the Russian flags. These were local residents who were chanting in favor of Russia. There were certain pro-Russian sympathies that existed in these territories at that time. Now, in 2022, none of the towns, in none of the towns that were occupied by the Russians, none of the territories, the villages that they'd taken over through the use of force, we don't see any signs of any embrace, public embrace of the Russian military or of the Russian state. And I think that is a very important fact that needs to be recognized. Uh, and in fact, what's happening right now 
is that despite the indiscriminate bombardment, the brutalities that the Russian military is imposing on the, Rus on the Ukrainian people, we see that most of the major Ukrainian cities turned into de facto fortresses that are resisting the Russian advances. And even I hear from people who are sitting in the shelters, who are hiding in the shelters from the Russian bombs, they are saying we should not give up. Under no circumstances can we give up. So there is a strong commitment to continued resistance on the part of the Ukrainians. We are also seeing multiple nonviolent demonstrations that are happening in occupied towns like uh, Kherson, Melitopol, Berdyansk, and many, many others. They are happening repeatedly over a long period of time now since uh, they were seized by the Russians several weeks ago. We are seeing the defiance of municipal authorities who are uh, surrounded, really surrounded by tanks, sitting in their offices and still making appeals to their public to resist the Russian occupation. They defy the orders that come from the Russian military command, and they insist that these territories should remain part of Ukraine. So we are seeing unparalleled examples of courage, of valor that is coming both from the Ukrainian soldiers who are fighting on the front lines, but also coming from ordinary citizens who are standing up to the Russian occupiers, standing up to the Russian soldiers in the streets of Ukrainian cities and from Ukrainian uh, municipal authorities and municipal officials who are still staying in their positions despite very difficult conditions. And that is the, that is the reason, as Stephen already mentioned, why Ukraine that seemed to be much weaker militarily compared to Russia, in fact, has managed to stall this military campaign of Russia. And we see a recognition of many multiple Russian experts who were initially cheering for this invasion as something that will happen very easily, suddenly completely puzzled about the absence of any serious progress, the one, the one that they expected. That brings me to uh, two final points. The first po point is on the future. And I wish I were as uh, optimistic uh, as Stephen is on, in terms of this, the future of the settlement. Unfortunately, I do not think this is likely. Uh, I think that the irreconcilable goals that I just out, down, uh, outlined means that Russia and Ukraine would not be able in any foreseeable future to, uh, would not be able to come to any settlement. Russia is unlikely to cede territories that it already captured. It's not going to do that. And Ukraine would never recognize the change in its own borders or give up on the people who already live in these occupied territories like or cities like Kherson, Melitopol, Berdansk, and others. Neutrality, another thing that is being discussed, is not going to work unless it's a voluntary choice of the nation to become neutral and not imposed from the outside. Neutrality also requires a multilateral agreement with other major parties that would provide some type of guarantees. But what kind of guarantees can Russia provide if it kept lying and de deceiving both the West and the Ukrainian people every time they would talk to us? So this means, unfortunately, in my view, that this war is, is not going to end in weeks or months, but it's going to go on for years, maybe decades. There may be ceasefires, there may be some kind of temporary uh, settlements, but it will continue for as long as the drivers of this conflict are present. And Stephen mentioned one of the drivers, and that is the patrimonial nature of the Russian state. And, and that driver is not new. Again, this is something that existed in Russia for centuries. Another important driver in my view is the outlook that Putin embodies, the outlook that puts Russia's territorial greatness as a major power above the pain that many ordinary Russians will be feeling in the next months and years because of this expansionist ambition of Mr. Putin. It denigrates ordinary Russians, it denigrates the value of their personal opinion, and it puts above everything else this idea of a special civilizing or historical, historical mission that Russia has to subjugate its neighbors. And so I think that even with Putin's removal, unless we see a substantive change in the nature of the regime and a substantive change in the ideological outlook of the people who are ruling Russia, 
we are not going to see much of a change in terms of the confliction between Russia and Ukraine. So that means, uh, last minute, uh, I want to emphasize how important it is for the West, for, for the countries in Europe, the United States, Canada, to provide long-term assistance for Ukraine. And that is not just military and financial, which is now discussed very often, and have we received a lot of it, but it's also institutional assistance. And so the appeal from uh, President Zelensky to accelerate uh, EU membership for Ukraine, I think is crucial. And if that happens, we will see in Ukraine, the Ukrainian society will see that Europe recognizes the sacrifice of the Ukrainian people for that they are doing not just for their own sake, but for the sake of other countries in Europe. And the idea that uh, Zelensky um, articulated today in the address to Congress with the creation of a new organization that would somehow help countries that are the targets of aggression, that idea, I think, deserves a very serious scrutiny and serious consideration on the part of the Western leaders. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I may be glitching in and out because they're working on the network in my neighborhood. Uh, so please bear with me if I disappear. Amy will step in and take over if, if I disappear. A little bit more on uh, Ola Onu. She's a leading international scholar of the politics of protest and is known for her innovative comparisons of Latin America and Eastern Europe. She's also an expert in the politics of Ukraine. Ola, I turn it over to you. Thank you. And indeed, speaking to you on the 21st day, said you, of war, um, it is quite a surprise to many uh, who might be watching. And as some of our panelists have already admitted, this, this is a situation of many miscalculations. It's a tragic result of many miscalculations, but let's not fool ourselves here. This is a moment for academia to also come to terms with, with what it has done wrong in, in the lead up to this war. Miscalculations are not only Putin's and the Kremlin's alone, certainly about uh, Ukrainian identity, civic attachment that we've written extensively on with people like Volodya Kulik and Henry Hale and Gwen Sasa, uh, but also just their capacity, their you know, troop to task ratio when it comes to their capacity to perform uh, on the ground, the use of paratroopers in the first instance that aren't actually highly uh, capable of dealing with interaction with citizens uh, and their losses in morale and logistical errors, and et cetera. Also importantly, miscalculations on Western government side. Now, if we start doing some historical process tracing and analysis, some of us were party to some of those conversations with our governments in the weeks and days prior to February 24th, we will note that many governments miscalculated about Ukraine's capacity to resist, about the strength of its army, about the capacity of its citizens to withstand and not welcome occupation. And those exact same miscalculations that the Kremlin and Putin had also resulted in our governments not providing as much support or uh, lethal military aid as they would have because they were, they were much more concerned with X, Y, and Z falling into the hands of Russians in the first 72 hours, rather than truly uh, standing by uh, Ukraine and supporting it. I'm glad that the West has indeed uh, supported Ukraine extensively. I'm glad to see the continuation of sanctions of a variety of kinds. Uh, I wish the United Kingdom would step up its uh, going through that list that it has. Um, it, it, I think we could do that a little bit faster in the UK. But certainly there is a great deal to be impressed by. But I would like to now turn to the miscalculations in the Academy. And as I said, some of those who are participating, watching, might actually have been party to those miscalculations. And in our review of where things can go, we really need to think to where we got things wrong and not just discursively. So what I'm telling you here in the next maybe eight minutes that I have left is based on the last 15 years of research in Ukraine, but more precisely 11 surveys conducted in Ukraine over the last eight years, the most recent of which was actually conducted in February, 2022. We're still waiting for that data. We are far more concerned with the safety of our partners than receiving that data. But we are actually starting new surveys right now, both amongst the displaced population uh, of Ukrainians and in Ukraine as well. 
So this divided society thing, we know now that that's clearly not true. We know that linguistic diversity and ethnic identity is not in fact something that is useful for understanding either political behavior or public opinion in Ukraine. It does not neatly overlap with uh, identity. It does not neatly overlap with civic identity and attachment to state or attachment to homeland, as um, my colleagues, Rigo Pop Elikish and Graham Robertson have said. But we really need to go back to our studies over the last eight years and look at which indicators we used to analyze Ukraine where we got that wrong and really come to terms with the mistakes we made. Because if we don't do that, in fact, in the next little while, uh, we will also get our understanding of where things are going wrong. I can go into greater detail with this. We did a special issue on this and Henry uh, has written extensively on the nature, Henry Hale has written extensively on the nature of relational identity in Ukraine. Why is that important? Because it wasn't actually different, I don't think, as he said, in 2014. We also conducted extensive uh, focus groups, qualitative interviews, and surveys among populations in the Donbass, both occupied and non-occupied territories. And identities can fluctuate. They can be triggered in different contexts and even in a conversation. They can be exposed or they can be hidden. And so this idea of the relational nature of li linguistic or ethnic or civic national identities in Ukraine really needs to be explored. When do people tack into which sorts of identity and to what purpose? I think here it's important to stress the work of Elise Giuliano, who did extensive research, as did actually Gwendolyn Sasa and Alice Lackner, where they focused both on uh, the occupied and non-occupied uh, territories of the Donbass, and they really found that there were socioeconomic inequalities that were far more important in driving any support to closer ties to uh, Russia and or separatism, uh, rather than ethnic, linguistic, or even civic identity um, aspects. The second, this history of weak post-communist civil society in Ukraine that we so much talked about until very recently. Um, I actually was had a paper under review a few months ago where somebody was arguing with us whether, whether it's true that Ukrainians were a protest nation indeed. I like to really stress that that is true. But seriously, where did we get it wrong? It's not that it started in 2004. It's not that it started in 2014 or 13. In fact, there's a very long extensive history of activism and engagement in Ukraine. In my work, I dated it back to 1920, but I'm sure we can go beyond this. And why is it important? So without, you know, there's multiple generations of Maidan, by my assessment, at least four in, in Ukraine. And each of those are very important when you conduct cohort analyses to understand state and civic attachment in Ukraine. But also there's a long history of a variety of different protest waves, social movement organizations, activist networks over time from dissidents and beyond. What people may not know um, about the history of Ukraine is that Ukraine actually had more dissidents per capita than any other Soviet Republic during the Soviet Union. And not least, these were also Russian ethnic, ethnic, ethnic Russians, Russian speakers, people of Jewish descent, and so on and so forth. Some of the most prominent figures, in fact, come from this group. And again, the things that bound them and united them was a sense of collective identity around a Ukrainian nation or state in the future. Um, and this is not a generational element. We found in our most recent cohort analyses that older generations are equally supportive of democracy, they have high levels of civic duty and attachment to the state, just as the younger generations might in Ukraine. So again, we might be getting it wrong on a variety of levels um, more historically. Most importantly, in the lead up to the war, I was making rounds with our data um, collected over the last three years from two different projects. We were saying that there is an incredibly high level of willingness and readiness to engage in protest if need be in Ukraine. In fact, at its highest level in the last seven years, eight years of our surveys, 55% of the Ukrainian population in April 2021, but also later in 2021 in our more recent surveys, were ready and willing to engage in protest to defend civic rights, 
we ask those questions as well, um, but also a strongly, strongly correlated to a, a perception of civic duty to do so, right? And yes, there was some regional variation, but we saw this jump across all regions of Ukraine in uh, between 2019 and 2021. Lastly, the Zelensky factor. It's really easy for everyone now to say, gosh, how impressive has his leadership been? How he, oh, it's perhaps him being an actor that he can you know, rise to the occasion, to the moment and use the capacity to speak in videos. It's not new. He didn't start doing this in the last few weeks. In fact, if anyone was paying attention to what Zelensky has been doing, they would have found and this this you can find this in survey data, you can find this in focus group data, you can find this in a variety of discourse analyses of his speeches even. He was an unlikely but nonetheless policy focused policy nuanced uniter in chief in Ukraine. And he was doing that even in his role, and I think it's unfair to call him a comedian only. He was uh, certainly a comedian, a satirical actor. He was also a lawyer by training and, uh, well, he had a, a little media empire um, uh, and very successful businessman, if you talk to his colleagues. And he was saying this stuff during his campaign that he's saying now. So we conducted actually last year a discourse analysis of Zelensky's speeches with um, Henry Hale, Gwen Sasa, and Volodya Kulik. We were focused on his messaging around the pandemic. And we found that the things he was saying in his shows around the country, uh, dating back to uh, 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, and so on, were very much the same. They were policy focused. They were about the war. They were about your Atlanticist positions. They were about civic duty. They were about unity from east to west amongst Ukrainian and Russian speakers. In fact, Natalia Gumenyuk, who did her own analysis of his uh, shows across the, the country in the lead up to the election, found that every single show not only had an element of political satire, some of this humor might not be something that we would have enjoyed, but nonetheless, uh, it was indeed political satire and it was nuanced that every single show ended either by discussing something, either by making a statement about the war, by making a statement of the need for peace, or making a statement of the civic duty to unify and stay united as a country. So ordinary citizens saw that, they heard that, and they weren't so surprised by it perhaps in 2019. Uh, he continued this speech. You can find many examples in his speeches if you want very much the same language he uses today. This is why he is seen as a legitimate leader and was continuously seen, by the way, as a legitimate leader amongst a very high portion of the Ukrainian population. The Zelensky effect is what we need to really talk about because what is different from 2019 to 2022 is the effect Zelensky had on particular constituencies in Ukraine because perhaps he is from Southeast Ukraine, because perhaps he, he is a Russophone, because perhaps he is a, a, of Jewish descent. A lot of Southeastern citizens saw themselves mirrored in him as a political figure. He was certainly not the first from Eastern Ukraine, but he was the first who publicly, repeatedly took a pro euro atlanticist position and tied it to unity amongst all speakers, all regions of Ukraine, and tied it to a civic duty. And we found this actually in our survey analyses. Uh, if you voted for him in 2019 or his party in the parliamentary elections of that same year, and you were from the Southeast of the country, you were 18% more likely to switch your position on your Atlanticist policies of Ukraine. And I think it is this Zelensky effect that actually began to threaten even more, uh, whether it's Putin or the Kremlin. And I think that helps explain the why now, other than the 100 years since 1920-22, I think it became clear that this is a country of many Zelenskys, of many people who may not speak Ukrainian, of many people who may have previously saw themselves uh, attached to different policy notes, 
who maybe don't agree with some of the things that past presidents have encouraged, but they definitely see themselves united in one state. And this is why when I think we look at the conflicts, we need to consider what will the Zelensky effect hold? So far, yes. Uh, will it be shored up when it comes at the local level? I think also. And I think most importantly, we know that Ukrainians will continue to fight. We know that likely this will be a very long and uh, bloody and tragic war affecting my friends and family members. But I think more importantly, it's an unwinnable war for all these reasons for Putin. It is, I think, more and more likely that two things will happen. Either there will be an internal shift in Russia and a breakdown of uh, Putin's power, potentially, uh, or Putin will do the same thing he's done so far, invent success, just like he invented a history of Ukraine's place in the Russian empire. He can also just say, we won. In fact, he will have won in some way. He will have destabilized Ukraine in, in, uh, to a great extent. He will have uh, limited Ukraine's military capacity. And he will have definitely threatened, I think, NATO enough to create a sense of non, uh, more, a lack of willingness among NATO partners to accept Ukraine into NATO membership. Thank you. Thank you. There are no questions posted in the Q&A. We, we, we encourage you to post your questions there. And if you have questions to specific panelists, please, please direct them. Um, or if you have general questions for the panel as a whole, then don't direct them. Our, our last presentation is by Yelena Subotic. A little bit about Yelena's work. She's a pioneer in international relations and the politics of the connection between identity, memory, and security. She's written extensively on the politics of war crimes in the former Yugoslavia and the appropriation of the Holocaust in post-communist Eastern Europe. So last but not least, Yel and I turn it over to you. Thank you very much. So I will speak only of things that I know a little bit about. Uh, I, will, I will really stay away from predictions. I'm never predicting uh, good about predicting anything, but, I, but what I, uh, I wanna talk about is the importance of memory politics uh, because this is what I do. And because unfortunately our time has come and memory politics is obviously uh, at, a, at a center of of this war in addition to geopolitical and strategic reasons we have heard about already. And it's been my view forever that in political science, we have downplayed uh, memory politics as an important element of our understanding of the world and comparative politics, especially the scholarship has been so influenced by studies of party politics and institutions and political economy, international relations, about grand strategy, alliances, military, all of which is obviously important, but I think uh, these latest events really uh, tell us how important it is to really centrally take seriously narratives, memory, and identity politics. And um, I, I do claim that memory politics does help us understand the Russian invasion, which as uh, we have already heard does look from you know, the outside as a self-defeating, um, ruinous adventure for Russia, but it is not such from the perspective of Russian political narratives and memory. So I want to just play up that part a little bit and talk a little bit about um, kind of Russian memory politics as it relates to Ukraine. So for example, in 2021, Russian Duma passed a law banning any public attempt to equate the aims and actions of the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany during World War II, as well as to deny the decisive role of the Soviet people in the victory over fascism. That's the exact quote from the law. And this is part of a series of memory laws that many countries in East Central Europe have been passing recently. Russia is not uh, the first one. Belarus passed something similar. And we probably all remember the 2018 uh, Polish law that uh, criminalized basically for all intents and purposes any insinuation that uh, 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 Poles um, participated in the Holocaust of Polish Jews. 
Uh, back to the Russian law, two days before the, the invasion of Ukraine, the Duma introduced a new bill that attached fines and prison sentences to this 2021 law. So this new bill further weaponized the memory law and made it clear that Putin's rewriting of the history of World War II has set the stage for his war in Ukraine. This rewriting of World War II and the memory of the war and Russia's role in it is obvious in every single thing Putin has said and done so far. He keeps using the language of denazification in a barrage of propaganda to rally Russians behind the war against Ukraine. He equates Ukrainians with Nazis. He selectively brings up the memory of Ukrainian nationalist militias who allied with the Nazis during World War II and participated in the Holocaust with Ukrainian Jews, but now equating the entire country, including its Jewish president, as being Nazis from World War II. Russia now, in Putin's view, like the Soviet Union then, is fighting the Nazis. And this is the narrative that is pushed forward. So Putin is tapping into the deep emotions surrounding the memory of World War II in Russia. The Soviet Union lost 27 million people in the war. Uh, Victory Day, which is celebrated every year on May 9th, is the most important Russian national holiday. Many Russians believe that the rest of the world has never fully appreciated their sacrifice in World War II. And in that, they're probably right. Most Americans, for example, believe that it is the US that ended the war on D-Day, having no idea that the war waged on the Eastern Front for almost an entire year afterwards. And that in fact, it was the Red Army that liberated much of occupied Eastern Europe, and of course, liberated Auschwitz in January, 1945. But Russia capitalizes on this memory imbalance by pushing this fantastical narrative that 2022 is in fact 1939. For the past year, the Russian state media has fed this grievance by publicizing thousands of declassified documents about Nazi war crimes during World War II, but then simultaneously hammering home a narrative about how present day Ukraine has been taken over by neo-Nazis. Therefore, again, Putin and Russia to the rescue. Putin in 2022, like Stalin in 1939, is attempting to reconfigure the geopolitical balance of power. Putin, like Stalin, is attempting to enlarge his state and expand its influence with this set of revanchist claims to territories that had once been part of a larger empire. But this is, as our previous speakers already told us, a much larger claim. It is a memory of Russian greatness and Russian perceived mythical greatness long before World War II and way deep into Russian imperial history. And what motivates him and Russians who support him is the deeply held belief that Russia was robbed of that greatness. So the memory of Russia's past looms large here, but I want to also briefly sketch out the narrative of Russia versus the West that guides a lot of this action. And that narrative is not just present in Russia or Russian minions like Belarus, but also in a country like Serbia. So I made myself read Serbian major mainstream newspapers since the invasion began, so you don't have to. And the narrative Serbian media present is not really about Ukraine at all. Ukraine is barely mentioned. It is a narrative about Putin fighting the West and winning, changing the Western world order that Serbs themselves feel has been unjust to them. Serbs also feel that they have been robbed of greatness by the West. And again, Russia and Putin to the rescue. It is a narrative against the West, against NATO, against the EU, and against liberalism. The problem is Russia is alone, and all the help from Belarus and Serbia may not help it in the end. We just have to see how many people die before this delusion of grandeur, this delusion of anti-Western exceptionalism, this delusion of past glory runs itself into the reality of the world that has changed, the region that has changed. And the young people who may not want to live away from Europe and in the loop where the only memories they're allowed to have are the memories of the siege of Leningrad. So memory politics is everything. We have ignored it in political science. We have relegated it to history. 
and we need to reclaim it back uh, as the real cornerstone of how we understand and teach the world around us. Thank you. All right, we have some questions in the Q and A. Amy, I thought I I may have missed the 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 first question because of my internet problems. There was someone who's first and last name began with F, though I don't remember it. Is that question still there? And do you want to pose it since that was the, the first one? So uh, Fabio Franchino, uh, writing the question during our first presentation, asked, um, autocracies face the risk of democratic transition, in this case embodied by the democratization of Ukraine. Could you give us an assessment of how credible this risk was or is for Putin's regime? And I, I think that was aimed at you, Steve, but I... sure, I'll, I'll say just a few words. Absolutely. Uh, no question, democratic Ukraine, Putin saw as a threat. I want to make sure I emphasize, of course, Putin thinks all of these democracies are puppets of the West. So in his mind, he's got an inability to understand genuine civic motivation from below. You know, in his day as a KGB colonel, the way that you organize demonstrations was by paying people and organizing them and having a few infiltrators of groups that were autonomous to try to make sure that they stayed under the state's control. And, you know, the line about Hillary Clinton suggests he still has that notion of democratic, uh, democratic organization. It's somehow somebody's manipulating it at all times. Uh, having said that, it's quite clear, whatever the causation in Putin's mind, that has, if you have a consolidated democratic Ukraine, as you did uh, with uh, the election of, of Zelensky, you are going to have a problem keeping the media control and the civil society control and the state oversight of everybody just next door. Uh, so it's the combination in Putin's mind of the democratic transmission threat and then the threat from the West that he associates with that. Uh, may I add something? Yes, if you want to add, please do. Yes, sure. So I want to add that the likelihood of uh, a dem an outcome of a democratic transition depends very much on the type of authoritarian regime that we are dealing with. And a number of political scientists, including Timothy Fry just recently, uh, identified or classified uh, Russian autocracy as personalistic autocracy. And if you look at the likelihood of autocracy, personalistic autocracy becoming democratic, you would see that it is actually very low. That the highest probability of uh, personalistic autocracy is to transition into another type of authoritarian regime, or as a result of transition to end up in the civil war. And so I, I think the hope that many of us have that there will be some type of regime change as a result of an implosion of uh, Russian government from within, based on our on the evidence we've seen as far as how these regimes operate and perform, I don't think that is a hope that we should uh, see as a, as a realistic, realistic scenario for Russia. Thanks. I'll, I'll move on to the next question, which is posed by Buket Ostas. Why do you think intelligence services, analysts, academics failed to predict the tough resistance of the Ukrainian people and army? How will this unity affect post-war Ukrainian nation building? It seems directed to Ola first and foremost, and then anybody else wants to chime in, please do. Well, shall we start with motivated reasoning and <laughs> other things? I mean, if people, analysts themselves are, are biased in a variety of ways. And if you hold a certain worldview, if you, you know, you seek information and data that confirms this, even analysts that are supposed to be trained to avoid it, um, and even academics. And this is why back in 2014, when Tim Colton, Nadia Kravitz, Henry Hill, and I started doing our work on identity in Ukraine, we really stretched out the different types of in, the, the instrument uh, which we use to, to measure these things, right? Um, and I think if you were satisfied with asking in a survey, for instance, asking one question about what language is your native language, and then treating that as ethnic identity, as well as some kind of allegiance to the state, well, you were going to get, you were going to find what you went looking for. And so much of our analysis was satisfied with using one indicator alone and loading it with all sorts of other import. And as we found in our research is that each one of these different indicators, the language ones 
speaks at home, the language one speaks at work, native language, the language you use your survey, conduct your survey in, even just on language use and practice and preference and embeddedness, all of those work in different ways and quite systematically over different regions of Ukraine. So I do think it was a combination of biases that we held, uh, not really investigating what we are measuring and what it's capturing. And I think not, um, yeah, and being satisfied when it showed exactly what we were expecting to find um, and, and, not, and not challenging ourselves enough. I'd like to just, if I may very quickly, Yelena, I couldn't agree with you more about memory politics and its import. And specifically, I would like to just do a shout out to my PhD student, Anna Glue, who just defended and she was studying how ordinary citizens in Ukraine, specifically in places like Poltava region, Poltava Oblast, uh, engaged in their own uh, commemorative activities. And she found very much the sorts of things that you were talking about, but at the ordinary citizen level. And again, something that people haven't been paying attention to enough, perhaps in places like Poltava Oblast. Michael, can I just make a very quick uh, point? It, I just want to be sure that people, when I said earlier that I was surprised by something, it's only on Ukrainian victory. So I absolutely predicted or expected uh, Ukraine to rise up and this to be a very difficult Russian invasion with long occupation resistance. Uh, so just to be sure, um, yeah, I was a bit surprised that victory became a possibility a couple of days in, and it really is a possibility. Okay, I'll proceed to our next question. What about Ukraine becoming a neutral state outside of NATO? Would this resolve the situation so that Ukraine can keep maintain its relationship with the West without direct aggression from Russia? And this is by Andrea Cooper. Yeah, I, I can take this one because I, I wrote an article very recently about why Ukraine actually rejects this option uh, of neutrality. And I have to say that I personally uh, have been a big proponent of neutrality for Ukraine. In fact, I uh, defended my undergraduate thesis in 1998 in Lviv uh, on neutrality. And, and the final chapter of that thesis was why Ukraine should become a neutral state. But granted, that was the time when Yeltsin was president. Uh, and now we are faced with a very different type of leader in the Kremlin. And so there are various, uh, very serious reasons why I think neutrality may not be as effective as many people claim or imagined before. And uh, one of those reasons I already mentioned, uh, that for many countries that are effectively neutral, uh, the country I, I am right now uh, in is Switzerland, has been neutral for 200 years. Uh, another country, Sweden, these countries in, uh, chose neutrality as a, basically an identity choice, as something that they identify with, that's something they're proud of, something that helps them to establish their own position in the international community, to serve as mediators of certain types of conflicts. Uh, neutrality uh, as an imposed choice by other major powers is something that I think will not likely last for a long time. Zelensky may still sign these deals if he is forced to under certain circumstances. But whether or not this document, this agreement, and, and this choice will be viewed as legitimate by the Ukrainian society and by the Ukrainian political elites is a very different matter. And so even if you see Zelensky basically moving in the direction of neutrality, it's not very likely at this point that the society will follow him. And if you see significant divisions within the society on this choice, I think the effectiveness of neutrality will be close to zero because neutrality is, is effective when all major powers understand that the country is going to remain neutral for a very long period of time, that this is a long-term choice, not a choice for the next five or 10 years. And it also is neutral from the standpoint of the country that makes this choice, if it is fully confident that all major powers that sign this agreement will never violate. And if there is a, a, a doubt or concern about the possible um, deception on the part of the major powers, the, again, from the standpoint of a neutral state, there will always be a risk of a renewed conflict. And so for us, of course, given our history of relationship with Russia over the last eight years specifically, 
Uh, it will be a very difficult choice uh, to make if neutrality is imposed and something that I'm not sure whether it will be effective uh, in the future. Anybody want to add on? All right, I'll just proceed. Jump in. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Also, there is quite a bit of now extensive um, data on the fact that not only is the general population, including in the East and South, um, moving away from the neutral position over the last eight years, uh, we also see a correlation to incidents or, of violence and escalation of threat from uh, including through some experimental methods uh, that that increases people's uh, distaste for the position of neutrality. So this war, if anything, would have hardened those who already were against that position and likely brought those who favored it to a, di a different side. Thanks. Um, I'm going to just jump the queue a little bit to get Yelena in here because there's a question directed directly to Yelena. Uh, the question is from Jonathan Chiarella. Is this whole war a nationalist win-win situation for Putin's Russia, no matter the tactical results? It asked, would a surviving Putin be able to make this an Alamo or Battle of Kosovo of sorts, a sacrifice for a noble, if doomed, military effort? So it depends on, um, I mean, I think the answer is no. Uh, I'll explain why very briefly. I think the, the content of the Russian um, uh, hegemonic national narrative is one of greatness. It's not one of victimization. Uh, it is, uh, it, victimization is then instrumentalized in order to pursue greatness, but it's different than the one uh, for example, in Serbia, which has, uh, as, as the question mentions, uh, used this defeat in, in, in Kosovo in 1389 to build this entire national narrative about uh, defeat, uh, but moral victory. And so there's always the defeat uh, somehow that leads into a, a higher moral ground. I don't think that that is the uh, the content that unites um, different aspects of a Russian narrative, which are about victory, which are about heroism, which are about sacrifice, but they're predominantly about, about greatness. So I think it's much more likely, at least that's I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, um, going back to uh, what, uh, one of August's uh, uh, possibilities in, in, in this you know, predicting that Putin would declare a victory and then declare that he had won and that Russia is great again and he made Russia great again and then we're you know celebrating again another invented victory day and have another parade about how we have conquered Ukraine um, even if the effects on the ground do not represent that but I don't think that um, a defeat or an acknowledgement of defeat would help uh, in any way pursue uh, Putin's narrative going forward. Thanks. Anybody else want to jump in before I move to the next yeah, question? I'll, I'll just say a word about how difficult it will be to pull that off. I don't disagree. Uh, my colleagues are right. That would be one way for Putin to, to try to create a face-saving narrative. But if Zelensky is still the president of Ukraine, you know, after kind of tarring him with this brush of neo-Nazism all this time, it's going to be very difficult to back down and say, well, we denazified and demilitarized Ukraine, but we still have that guy in power. And as Sergei was saying earlier, how do you get rid of Zelensky and put someone else in power when all Ukraine is united around him? Uh, so I, I think it's going to be basically very bad for Putin's legitimacy, kind of going down the road a little bit. Last thing I'll say is this is not met with the kind of response that the Crimean annexation did in 2014 in Russia. It is very sad, and lots of Russian intellectuals are ashamed that they partook in some of that enthusiasm today. Uh, but there isn't enthusiasm for this war in Russia. There's at best a kind of sullen willingness to go along. Um, some people only watch state TV, just believe what they see, but many, many other Russians are incredibly depressed by it. Can I Speaking of... Example? Sorry, Michael. I just, go ahead. What, what Stephen said is interesting. Here, I think there's one thing. If you look at the discourse around Zelensky, um, what Putin has said, and um, several others, uh, no need to name all their names, uh, is that it's, yes, Zelensky is not himself a Nazi, but he had to give in to Nazis. So he can still get rid of the Nazis 
And then Zelensky has decided to go on the right path, right? So that, that because he has not identified Zelensky outwardly as part of the, because it made no sense, obviously. Um, so I think I'm very, I'm trying to stay hopeful that that's the not. Okay, speaking of Vladimir Putin, I have a question from Murad Gafarov. How much does this have to do with Putin and his individual will? Would you agree that this war, at least some of the conflict, would be inevitable even with, with a more liberal leader? The view that all these territories, the former Soviet Union, rightfully belong to Russia, is not exclusive to Putin. It's possible, Sergei, and I would have a disagreement here. I do think the regime is patrimonial, but I also think that leaders make a difference. Uh, you know, Putin is, it's very unfortunate for Russia that he was the one who inherited the mantle from Yeltsin uh, and also the presidency in return for promising Yeltsin's family that they'd be freed from prosecution. He came to it with the instincts that I described in my pre brief presentation, and they only hardened over the years. So I don't believe um, in a purely structuralist version of history in which Russia is doomed to be patrimonial because of its placement in the world system or because of cultural legacies. Uh, we used to say those kinds of things about Germany, and so history can change. Uh, but it does take uh, some very determined leadership to shift countries off of these kinds of tracks. And the problem now, and I maybe do agree with Sergei here, is that the um, elimination of opposition in Russia and the brain drain that's occurring now will create even less human capital to create that kind of opportunity when Putin's gone. I still want Putin gone, though. Um, so, yeah, actually, Stephen, I, I agree with most of what you said. Um, there are certain key liberal leaders like Boris Nemtsov who criticized um, Putin early on uh, and warned that this is where this uh, regime is, is going to. Um, so I think we can imagine certain individuals who probably would have made very different choices from Putin. But even some within the Russian liberal opposition who want or seek power, like Alexei Navalny, and I don't want to say anything negative of him because he is in jail now, but we remember his statements uh, where he compared Crimea, I think, to a sandwich, and he said there is no point in giving sandwich back and forth. This is Crimea is not a sandwich, so there is no point in giving back this territory, um, and and so those politicians in Russia, like Yevlinsky, Nemtsov who actually take a, a, a very, um, uh, I think, open-minded view of Ukraine that recognizes and honors Ukrainian independence, uh, recognizes that Ukraine has the right to make sovereign choices. These types of politicians probably have close to zero chance of, of uh, winning in uh, democratic elections. Uh, and so for Alexei Navalny, who clearly had more stronger political instincts, I think, he understood that in order to have a chance even of winning in any type of election, he needs to go closer to a median voter. And the median voter in Russia, I think, I think still believes that Crimea truly belongs to Russia and possibly other parts of Ukrainian territory too. So, so here I think that it's the Russian society needs to change as well. There needs to be some type of transformation in the outlook of average Russians with regard to not only Ukraine, but Belarus, Armenia, Central Asia, uh, all other parts of um, post-Soviet space that were once part of the Russian empire and Russian state. Can I add a little bit, a uh, few sentences to that? Yeah, I, I agree. And I do think the issues are somewhat larger than Putin. Putin is you know, a, a creation of his environment just as much as he creates the environment. These leaders don't come from nowhere. They, they come from particular you know, social groups. and. Navalny not only had what you just said, had to say about Ukraine, but he also had to say many uh, problematic things about, for example, the LGBTQ issues in Russia. So the issue is not just foreign policy narrative and foreign policy um, ambitions. It's also an under understanding of liberalism and to what extent uh, there's a dedication to liberal values domestically towards Russian domestic population in addition to treating your neighbors and neighboring countries with respect. That's, that's a problem that is beyond just Putin. When we designed this panel, we thought it was an amazing diversity of uh, 
of, of expertises, and I thought we would be able to handle every question, but I think I've discovered a question we may not, that may not come under the expertise of this panel. This panel, this question is from Alfred Killis. Being a native of Sweden, I'm interested to hear what risks you all find in the situation that the situation poses to non-NATO nations such as Sweden and Finland. Does anybody have a response to that one? I'll just make a quick point, which is, as you know, Sweden and Finland are really debating whether to join. And if there was anything to push these countries out of neutrality into NATO's embrace, it would be Putin's invasion of Ukraine. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, it's hard to imagine a Putin strike on one of the neutral states of Europe as an alternative to war with a NATO state. I mean, the only way that would be an extra danger to Sweden or Finland, unless my colleagues see something I don't, would be if he were to use that vulnerability, so to speak, as a way of kind of probing uh, weaknesses in the Western alliance more generally. And I can't imagine he would try that. Uh, you know, first of all, the geography of this is that NATO countries are the ones on the border um, other than Moldova. And so those are the ones that will most likely be affected. And um, the second thing is that the US and the Europeans would be staunchly united against any such attack, uh, whether it would happen in Sweden, Finland, or a NATO member. So I, I don't think it's a special danger for those countries. Yes, I, I agree with uh, Stephen. Just very quickly, I think we are going from one extreme to another. That is, one extreme was we completely downplayed and dismissed the possibility of Russian invasion of Ukraine. We used all kinds of rational choice models to explain why the cost would be so huge for Putin that he would never do it. But now that he did it, we start thinking that possibly he can just attack anyone and attack any member, uh, NATO member country and possibly United States as well. And I think that that is another extreme that is not very useful in terms of understanding his uh, decision making. From Putin's standpoint, his goals were very clear and open for a very long time. And it was one striking uh, moment during the press conference of uh, Sergei Lavrov a few days ago, where he put out the article from Merzheimer uh, from Foreign Affairs and started reading from it and said, look, guys, Western scholars, American political scientists were telling you that we are going to attack Ukraine if it doesn't change its behavior. You were not listening to us. So in their viewpoint, it was a logical continuation of uh, multiple warnings that were coming out of Russia, starting from the Munich conference onwards regarding the inadmissibility of further NATO enlargement. That was their, uh, I think that is their outlook as, as to why they're behaving right now. There should, be, should have been no surprises. And, and so I think that's why uh, imagining that they suddenly would out of nowhere uh, strike uh, Sweden on Finland, I, I, I think that is beyond the realm of possibility. Murad had a second question. I'm going to skip over that until we get first questions from everybody. The next question that I'm going to pose seems to fall within Ola and Serhe's um, expertise more than anybody else's. In the long run, what are the odds of Ukraine turning into a conflict-ridden zone riddled with institutional failures and armed groups similar to what happened to Afghanistan after the Soviet invasion? Yeah, so um, I, I think this, this is a very serious danger when we look at the pictures and images coming out of Ukraine. Uh, we certainly feel that at some point, that may be, become an image that everyone would get used to, a conventional image of a country permanently in crisis, permanently in conflict, permanently destroyed. And so gradually, just like in the case of Syria, just like in the case of multiple other disaster zones, countries that experience serious conflicts uh, that are under attack, the public attention, the international attention will start to drift away. And that any minor uh, ceasefire or some kind of a settlement will lead for people to withdraw from watching what's happening there. Um, and uh, I think if we see a prolonged conflict that will happen for months or years that will be as intense as it has been now, then certainly there is such a risk. I would not totally exclude it, uh, that the country would fragment uh, we already see um, instances, unfortunately, of chaos in different parts of Ukraine. We see mar marauding going on in some cities. Um, for, for now, because of Zelensky's uh, really strong leadership, uh, amazing uh, demonstration of courage on his part, the centralized authority managed, it manages to hold on. 
Uh, and I think that really attributes to the fact that Zelensky stays in Kiev, stays in his office, demonstrates every day that he is uh, on top of things, speaks and communicates to the society consistently. Uh, but if Russians, and I don't want to think about that, but if there is a possibility that Russians will somehow destroy that centralized authority and uh, remove somehow him or push him out of the country, then I think the possibilities of a more chaotic development, unfortunately, may be quite likely. In principle, I, I do believe that this is going to be a longer conflict, more likely than not. And although in terms, and I think what said he said are all possibilities. Um, I do think that this is not a question of getting rid of Zelensky and the centralized control falling apart. Uh, essentially, part of the miscalculation is that it's not only about it really, Zelensky is such an important figure, and there is a Zelensky effect that has transcended uh, a variety of electoral constituencies in Ukraine. It's not just about Zelensky. It turns out that when it comes to uh, Ukrainian political and military leadership and business leadership is able to unite around the center, around the state. And I don't think this is actually that surprising. Whilst different types of political aggregations used all sorts of divisive and polarizing language to win elections. Uh, when it came down to it, they actually saw far more unity where it was most important. Uh, you can even, you know, can take, maybe we'll leave Yanukovych out of it, but certainly uh, a large membership of the party of regions would have bound around uh, the state of Ukraine when necessary. And they have in, the, in more recent times. Kuchma as well, um, you know, maybe he sometimes used divisive political language uh, but certainly um, fell in line and and very, I mean, he was actually your Atlanticist. People didn't really give him credit enough for that. So I think it's not just take out Zelensky and you can um, destabilize Ukraine in, and create infighting. And uh, I think more problematic here is actually Russian ability to do that. Um, even if they took Kiev, they wouldn't take all the other necessary cities at that time. Um, and it seems this pattern of not understanding that it's literally a country of many Zelenskys. And here I'd like to say maybe a, a country of many Ivan Zubas. Ivan Zuba died the night when the Russian army formally entered into Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts on February 22nd, I believe. Um, Ivan Zuba is a famous Ukrainian dissident. He was born in Donetsk oblast. He was a Russian speaker all his life until adulthood. Um, and he became one of the most famous Ukrainian dissidents um, against Russian chauvinism, colonialism, and imperialism. Um, he was actually a, a, a trying to <laughs> take down Russian chauvinism from a Marxist perspective, in fact. So I think it's a country of many Ivan Zubas and Zelenskys, and you can't just get rid of one, um, and you won't get rid of the idea of Ukrainian statehood. Hey, our next question is from Brian Moraski. What is your assessment of fact-checking organizations like Bellingcat on changing the hearts and minds of on the on the changing of the hearts and minds of policymakers on ordinary citizens? How well is the West performing in its efforts to counter Putin's war on truth, let alone historical accuracy? Well, let me take a stab, I mean, was the question about changing hearts and minds in Russia uh, or elsewhere? Because in Russia, it's kind of irrelevant. I mean, there's, a, there's almost a complete information blockade and it's very difficult to get information. I mean, you know, it's, I will say as someone who's lived, I've lived in an authoritarian uh, regime in Serbia under Slobodan Milosevic during his authoritarian regime when, you know, there was an information blockade. It's not nearly as, all encompassing obviously as what Putin is trying to do. But my point is that we sometimes just assume that people can't get any information, but oftentimes people can get information. And sometimes people, you know, like, like people everywhere, they are attracted to sources of information that they want to hear. Um, so Russians are no different than anybody else in, in wanting to listen to things that they kind of already believe. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I don't think it's accurate to say that Russians cannot know at any time what's going on. I think, I think some Russians can and, and some Russians do. Um, 
but if the question is how fact checking groups are changing you know western perception that's that's maybe a different thing i don't think the issue of western perception is the problem of fact checking i think we have the facts it's more the the paralysis of of only bad choices and the and the real danger of miscalculation and an escalation of the war, which is not something that I think the West wants. Um, but um, I, I don't think the issue is a lack of facts at this point. I do have some optimism on the Western side of this. And, and the reason for that is that I think it was easier to indulge in a kind of cynical acceptance of multiple facts, quote unquote in the West when you thought that was a way of thumbing your nose at the meritocracy or globalization or neoliberalism or things that you kind of thought were oppressing you, but not too badly. But when you have the actual invasion of a democratic country by an authoritarian imperial power, um, it's a little more difficult to spin as perhaps one way of looking at the alternative facts. Um, you do see at least temporarily more bipartisan, uh, a little, there's some limits to that bipartisanship, but the response in Congress has certainly been a little bit more united than previous points. So perhaps that feeds over into the public sphere more generally and the space for rational and civic discourse expands a bit. I just wanted to note, there is some data coming out of Russia that, that there are shifts in opinion. And we have to be very weary about the, the sources of data and collecting data in this context right now is incredibly problematic. Um, but there's one source you can actually access all the data yourself and run analyses and checks on it. And it's coming off, again, huge biases associated with this data, but it's coming out of Navalny's um, sociological team. And what they did, interestingly enough, is they, so far, I believe they're running a third wave right now, but uh, it's a cross-sectional survey on February 25th, the second day of the war. They ran an online survey. Um, and then on March 5th, they ran the exact same questions again. So same methodology, same biases, same problems associated with the survey over time. Uh, on uh, February 25th, 44% of their respondents believed that sanctions would be catastrophic towards Russia. By March, <clears throat> by March 5th, that went to 60%. So a huge jump within this particular group. This is at a time when the, these same individuals would have less access to a variety of independent sources. Um, similarly, uh, they, the, 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 these data saw a jump from 29% uh, on February 25th, believing that Russia is the aggressive 53% on March 5th. Now, these are huge shifts in a very particular maybe group um, even if there's a much smaller percentage of the general population of Russia that is also experiencing this shift, this is suggesting that they do in fact have access, as Yelena said, to a variety of other information. Um, and that even when you up the propaganda and the restrictions, uh, people are not falling in line or falling for it. So I think, although the question was about Western acceptance of certain informations and propaganda, I think we need to be careful with, that this is actually maybe not working in Russia. Um, and even within that group, there could be a huge portion of individuals who have falsified preferences um, that are to feel threatened to expose their real position on these things. But if we're seeing such a big jump, I think we're definitely going to see a small jump. And I think that, again, is a positive uh, thing that's happening. We, we've exceeded our 90 minutes. There are a lot of good questions left here. Unfortunately, we do not have time uh, to get to them. There's clearly, you know, a lot of interest that we haven't fully covered, but I really do have to thank the panelists for, for excellent presentations and, and, and great responses to the Q&A. And I'm gonna hand it back to Amy to uh, close it out. Thank you, Michael, for your moderation and also for all of the panelists and our attendees, especially those who've, who've hung with us. Uh, I'm so sorry that we won't be able to answer your questions. Um, we will, as I said, post this recording on the CES website. We will have more information on each of our panelists. Um, the center also has a Ukrainian resources page on our website uh, where we have other people's talks, other people's panels. Um, so there's another opportunity to hear so many of the really fine um, engagements with the, the topic that are ongoing and uh, unfortunately will we'll probably keep going um, as, as we move forward. So again, thank you to all of you for taking your time to, to engage with us. Um, you know, I hope, I hope someday we can have a, 
a much more optimistic panel about how, how we move forward.